Now's your chance to roll up your sleeves and we're going to do some work in evangelical apologetics. So if you've got your section five of your binder here, I'd like you to turn to it because the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is actually fill out a little worksheet that's based on a scripture. So if you flip over past all the testimony workshop things, you can follow along in, uh, on this sheet and it has lots of blank spaces. So hopefully by the end of this little talk, you'll have all those blank spots filled in with your own ideas and then uh, corrected ideas if you messed it up the first time, okay? <laughs> so what is apologetics? It comes from a Greek word, apologia, which means an explanation or a rational defense. It doesn't mean I apologize for being Catholic, okay? <laughs> or I'm sorry. <laughs> it means rather uh, a defense, something that you would give to defend your point of view. And it involves the use of reason. So it is not an emotional appeal. It is a reasoned explanation that someone can hear and understand the logic of it and then come to a conclusion that matches what you're defending. And the basic reason we need to have this is because people in our evangelistic work will have objections. They will disagree with things. There will be obstacles in the way, this path that you're trying to lead them down, right? Maybe you're walking them down along a path with the ultimate relationship book, right? And you'll run into an obstacle, and it won't just be an obstacle that they're making up to try to deflect the issue. It'll be a sincere objection. So this is what apologetics is for. It's to clear away the obstacles on the road that leads to the doorstep of faith. Even before people might believe all of these things, they have to have some of these explanations given to show that, yes, faith is not against reason. It's not irrational. It's beyond reason, but it's not against reason. So, the scriptural motivation for this is 1 Peter 3.15. I actually have this scripture on my little card that I made up for when I was ordained because it's one of my favorite scriptures, and I think it's a theme scripture for me anyway. Reverence Christ as Lord in your hearts. Should anyone ask you the reason for this hope of yours, be ever ready to reply, but speak gently and respectfully. 1 Peter 3.15. If you could memorize that, you, it would go a long way. Apologetics is usually done when someone fill in the blank. Just raise your hand, I'll point to you back there. When someone asks, all right, and what's that based on? It's based on the scripture. Should anyone ask you the reason for this hope of yours? Well, that's the moment when you're going to be doing apologetics. It's usually not done kind of as a preemptive strike, okay? Or <laughs> like, you know, okay, I'm gonna answer everyone your objections. Well, gee, I never thought of that one. Yeah, maybe that is a problem, you know? <laughs> like, usually it's done when someone has an objection because it's not always necessary if someone doesn't object, well, then move right on with evangelization. But when it does, when someone does ask a question, um, what things do you think need to be happening in the life of a Christian already in order for them to do apologetics. Let's say someone is asking them a question. What, maybe from the scripture or from something else. Hannah, I'll just point to you. Yeah, Terry. Okay, you need to know something about your faith. I would definitely agree with that. What, what else would, would need to be happening in the heart of the Christian? Yeah. Okay, you have to have faith you're not just doing a theory here, but that you have a living faith relationship with Christ. It says, reverence Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's the beginning of the scripture. So is Jesus your Lord? Well, that needs to be something solid in your heart in order for you to do this work. Anything else? Yeah. 
Okay, so you could, you could fill up a long list of things that unite us to Christ, that give us this living relationship with Christ. But I would, I would just include, uh, in general, a, a life of prayer is necessary to do uh, effective apologetics because that enables you to, to really be at, in, a, in, a, in a peaceful place so that people will see that you're reverencing Christ as Lord in your hearts. So in order to be ready to reply, Christians need to blank and know their blank. This is kind of a tricky one, but this is like read the mind of the questioner, right? <laughs> what did you put in there? Yeah. Uh, love and know their faith. Okay, love and know their faith. So actually what I put in here is know their faith, definitely. But what does it take to know your faith for apologetics? Who said it starts with an S? Study. The most important thing. For apologetics, love is very important. But in order to be ready to reply, we have to study. You have to roll up your sleeves and get into, you have to read. You have to know the content of the faith and know the reasons why we believe what we believe. It's even more than catechism. Catechesis is when you are presenting a systematic description of what the Catholic Church teaches, what Christ teaches. But apologetics goes further than that and gives the basis, the rational basis, why, an argument for the teaching from first principles, building it all up, like building blocks. And that takes even more work than just explaining what we believe. And that's necessary because if you just say, well, the church believes this, you know, so you ought to believe it, what, what might they say? Well, why should I believe the church? They don't accept the authority of the church. So they're not going to just believe it because the church teaches it. You have to give them a reason why they should believe. And that takes study. You need to look at uh, a lot of different things. What you have to study depends on what kind of apologetics you're doing. What inner attitudes are essential for good apologetics? Inner attitudes. Anyone? You got? Yeah? Okay. Humility and conviction is what she had. I would agree with that. Some other ones? Yeah? Okay, gentleness comes right from the scripture, right? Speak gently and respectfully. So another one you could put from the scripture is respect. If you don't have these attitudes, you could win the argument and lose the person. <laughs> Why? Because they're, they see that you're right, and they're really mad that you're right, <laughs> and then they're going to walk away. You win the battle, you lose the war. That's not what we're trying to do. The goal is not to win the argument. Don't, order, don't argue in order to uh, win, but in order to explain, okay? It doesn't matter whether they even agree with you at the end, as long as they understand the reasoning behind what you're saying, okay? You don't have to force it. Gentleness and respect. What might a non-Christian conclude if his or her sincere questions are not answered? <laughs> Okay, that you don't know what you're doing. Might they generalize that beyond that? What, what did you have? Yeah. Okay. There it is. That there is no answer. This is happening among young people in our schools who are asking these questions, and for whatever reason, their catechesis program or their situation, they're not given the answers. What do they conclude? Well, either there aren't any answers or these Christians, you know, don't really have their act together. Christianity is for dummies, <laughs> people who don't really address the difficult questions. It's for intellectual lightweights. It's not for me. And they walk away. Now, did they make the correct conclusion? No. Maybe you just didn't know the answer or the person they were asking didn't know the answer. But it's hard to blame people if they went from one Christian to another, and they keep asking the same question, and they never get an answer, they just get platitudes, or because that's what the church says, or whatever. 
I don't blame someone after that point for saying, well, maybe there isn't an answer. They're wrong, there actually is, <laughs> but they were really looking and they didn't get it. This is why apologetics is so important. It's not that everyone has to be the master apologist who has all of the answers, okay? None of us, myself included, and I've studied apologetics, have all the answers in this realm. There's too many questions. But you need to know some of the answers, and then you need to know where to go, where to point people for the answers. And that's what we want to try to equip you with resources so that you can feel confident on some issues and then point people for the answers for the rest. Bad motives for doing apologetics? I would think uh, to try to prove to someone how smart you are, <laughs> that would be a bad motive. To, um, to get back at someone who is kind of annoying you with this question, okay? You could be doing it out of pride. Uh, look at how much I know, or triumphalism. We've got it and you don't. Those would be bad motives. Good motives is out of love for the person as we said before, we need love. Love is desiring the best for the beloved, giving them what they truly need. And so studying is actually an act of love for the person you're going to meet in the future that you haven't even heard, heard from them yet. It's an act of love you do in advance with the motive of being ready to reply when they do ask. So if you think of it that way, it unites your heart with your mind when you're studying for apologetics. And as I said before, a good, apo good apologist does not argue in order to win, but in order to explain. In order to explain. Now I put on this sheet on the bottom categories of apologetics. There's different types. Philosophical apologetics deals with questions that you approach with at the very beginning, does God exist? The problem of suffering, of evil. It's using just the tools of philosophy, which are reason and nature, or experience, human experience. You are not allowed to use the Bible. <laughs> you are not allowed to use Catholic teachings uh, because they wouldn't accept that as being uh, true, okay? So you can only use reason and natural experience. This is the hardest kind of apologetics, philosophical apologetics. Then you would move on to Christian apologetics, which talks about the uniqueness of Christianity. Why should I look at Christianity? What is the evidence that Christianity is true? That Jesus really is God? Isn't Jesus just a good man? What about, you know, hell or all these teachings of Christians? Why should I believe those? Do they really make sense? Now here, you're also using reason and natural experience, and you can use the scriptures, but only as a historical record, not assuming that they are infallible. So you can also add on the scriptures, but just as evidence for what happened in that time. Well, this is what Jesus said, this is what he did, so you're using it as a historical record, not as infallible, okay? Then you can move on. So that's to bring someone from, okay, I believe in God, but what about this Jesus guy? After that, if someone already believes in Jesus and believes he is the son of God, they're a Christian, well, then there's Catholic apologetics, which is a defense for the beliefs that are particularly Catholic, that maybe Protestants or other non-Catholic Christians might not accept. For instance, prayer to the saints, purgatory. What about scripture alone or faith alone? All I need is the Bible. The teachings on Mary. Why do you call priests father anyway? Doesn't it say, call no man your father in Matthew 22? Why go to a priest for confession? All of these questions presume someone has faith in Christ, but they don't buy into all the Catholic teachings. So in this case, can you use scripture? You bet. Can you presume that it is infallible, that it has no error in it? Yes, because they would accept that also. So in this third level, you get to use the scriptures full force. In fact, for most Protestants, if you don't use the scriptures, you're going to get nowhere, right? <laughs> so the scriptures become almost exclusively used. You can also use the church fathers 
who are early Christians, early Christian teachers, and you can use, again, history and so on and so forth. You might also end up using, in some of these, uh, natural experience, you might use archaeology or history or even science as tools to build up evidence for your arguments. Okay? So, as you can tell, depending on what kind of apologetics you're doing, you might have to do study in a variety of areas. It can get quite involved, <laughs> let me tell you. But that's okay, because you don't need to know it all. You just need to know the, the lay of the land and then how to point people to the resources they might need or to other people that, that you might refer them to. I actually get a lot of referrals from people who say, this person has a question about this. Can you deal with it? And it's an apologetics thing. So I enjoy that. Um, I do that for fun, OK? <laughs> so kind of weird that way, but that's the way it goes. So turn to your section of your binder, uh, section number seven. And you will see a list of apologetics resources. And in fact, we're going to hand out for you right now some more apologetic resources. If I can get uh, Richard to come forward, uh, yeah, just to get ready with that for when I'm doing it. So you'll notice that there are a set of things. Just start to flip through them as I go. The first basic question, can you even prove that God exists? You can read that to see the answer. Then you have arguments for God's existence. How do we know God is real? Argument from design, which shows from the order and, and purpose in the plan of the creation that there must be a designer. Argument from first cause. If you flip the next page, you'll see a little picture on the argument first cause of a, of a chain of cause and effect. If you trace back causes to their, or effects to their causes, eventually you have to get to a first cause. St. Thomas Aquinas is, says, this we call God. <laughs> That's the ending of all good arguments for God existence. You, you prove that something must exist, and then you say, that's God <laughs> at the end, OK? So each one of these arguments uh, is not a complete proof. They build on one another. They give you slices of God, if you will, <laughs> that he is a designer, that he is the first cause that set everything into being. That, and if you flip two more pages, you have an argument from conscience. Why is it that everyone seems to have this understanding, basic understanding of right and wrong? Why do we feel guilty about things? Why should we if there is no absolute truth or if there is no law giver? I should just be able to make up my own law. Why does it seem like I can't do that effectively? That I always seem to keep coming back to something bigger than me that's telling me don't do this or that this is wrong. Well, the source of that is a lawgiver. This we call God. And if you keep going, argument from history, I won't get into that one much, argument from Pascal's wager, you can read that again. So all of those are arguments for why we can know with certainty, using reason and experience, that God exists. The one argument against God's existence, the biggest one, there are a few, maybe three that are used. The biggest one is that there's all this suffering and evil in the world. So how could a good God who loves us and is all powerful allow evil to happen? If God is all good and he's all, know uh, and he's all powerful and he's all loving, then evil shouldn't exist. God must not be powerful enough to get rid of it or he must not be loving enough to want to get rid of it or he must not, you know, uh, be good. Maybe he's an evil God, right? <laughs> That's why there's evil. He, you know, or there's two gods. There's a good God and there's an evil God. And the good one made good and the evil one made evil. You get all these problems because of the existence of evil. So this is a, an answer to the question of how we can reconcile evil existing with God being all good, all loving, and all powerful, which Christians hold to both of those, okay? And that's the question. How can we do that? Why is there evil in the world? So those are all philosophical apologetics, as we mentioned before. Philosophical apologetics, they don't use the Bible as um, revealed by God. They just use what we can see and using our head. 
Then we move into Christian apologetics with the divinity of Christ. Who is Jesus? Is he God? And now I will just briefly explain. Did you get to the page that says Lord, lunatic, or liar? Okay, stop there for a second. We're just going to go over that pretty quickly. Give you, give you a taste of what it looks like to do apologetics. So here is the argument for the claim that Jesus is God. This is a very essential thing for evangelization, right? If someone doesn't believe that Jesus is God, what do they usually think about Jesus? What's the common thing you ask there? What do you think of Jesus? He's just a man. He's a good man, right? He's probably a good teacher, right? Good moral teacher, good guy. We like him. But, you know, that's about, that's about enough, right? All this God stuff. I mean, where did you get that, right? Well, first thing you start with is the scriptures which say Jesus claimed to be God. He asked people, who do you say that I am? And they would give different answers. And in particular, Jesus made statements where he claimed to be divine. He said, I and the Father are one. Whoa. That's pretty major. So, secondly, he said, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. It's like, hold on a minute here. You're claiming to be greater than Abraham? To exist before Abraham? To use I am, which is the divine name that was revealed to Moses in the Old Testament? Whoa, you're claiming to be God. And in fact, his hearers understood it that way. They said, they took up stones to throw at him. The Jews answered him, we stone you for no good work, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, claim to be God. They knew what he meant, <laughs> and Jesus didn't deny it. <laughs> he basically evaded the stones, right? <laughs> but he didn't deny the claim to be divine. And then after the resurrection, Thomas came up to Jesus, and Jesus said, look, I'm here. I, I feel, feel the nail prints. I'm alive again. And Thomas goes to his face. He says, my Lord and my God. And he says that to Jesus, if you read the Greek. <laughs> to him, my Lord and my God. This is not an exclamation of surprise. My word. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Jesus says to him right afterwards, have you believed because you have seen me? What does that mean? Thomas just came to belief, to faith that he is God. That's the, the implication. So he's receiving his worship. <laughs> he's not denying it. He says, oh, finally, you got with the program. You realize who I am. That is a very clear proclamation of Jesus' divinity. So the question is, what do we do with all of this? If Jesus claims to be God, that's our, our premise. Now, that's based on accepting the scriptures here as a good historical record. So what are the possibilities? We can draw a tree. This is using logic. Either the claim is false, or the claim is true. Does anyone agree with that? Are there, is there a third possibility? No. <laughs> That's a rule of logic. Either a statement is true or it is false. There's no third option. This is very important because we're trying to be very uh, systematic and complete. So it might seem silly, but that actually matters, that there's only two options. Jesus either knew it was false, or he didn't know it was false. Are there any other possibilities? Again, no, using a principle of logic. If he knew it was false, then he made a deliberate statement to deceive people. I'm going to claim to be God. I know I'm not God. What am I? I'm a liar. That's what I am. I'm deceiving people. Similarly, if Jesus claims to be God and he didn't know that it was false, I, then he thinks he's God, but he's not. Now, the definition of your degree of sanity 
is equal to how much your idea matches reality, especially your idea of who you are. If I think I'm a, a frog, then I'm probably losing it, right? <laughs> you know, more so than if I thought I was a bohemian, uh, you know, um, dancer or something, I don't know, or actor, right? You no, know, then I'd be just a little bit off, you know, not really in touch with reality. If Jesus thinks he's God and he's not, and, and, and he isn't, then he's completely lost touch with reality. Because the difference between God and us is what? Infinite difference. So Jesus is a lunatic. He has lost it completely. In fact, there is a clinical condition where people think that they're God, right? And they're actually in insane asylums in a lot of cases. So, the third possibility is that it's true. What does this mean? Well, he's Lord. <laughs> he is who he says he is. Using the logic of this, this is called a trilemma. There are three possibilities, and for somebody who thinks Jesus is a good man, guess what? He doesn't like any of them, right? <laughs> He says, well, gee, I, I don't see good man in there. Could we, like, stick that one in, you know? <laughs> well, the answer is no, you can't. Jesus didn't leave us that option. C.S. Lewis says this, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing people always say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man saying he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either the man is who he says he was, the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Talk about a bazooka right between the eyes, huh? Like, boom! Well, I mean, he, he speaks in a very strong way. This is in one of his books. You know, I'm not saying you have to you know, yell that at someone at the top of your lungs while you're doing apologetics, but I am saying that the clarity of this argument is very powerful. It can actually bring someone out of this fuzzy, fuzzy, warm you know, kind of thinking into the cold, hard reality of logic, which says you've got to make your choice. Now, from here, you can explain why Jesus isn't a liar and why he isn't a lunatic. By looking at the Gospels and the evidence, trying to compare some qualities of liars with qualities of Jesus, compare some qualities of lunatics with qualities of Jesus, and you're not going to see many other matching points. Jesus has a penetrating wisdom that lunatics don't have. Lunatics actually get quite boring to listen to if you've ever listened to them. They end up kind of not having any inner coherence or meaning to what they're saying. Similarly, uh, liars uh, <clears throat> are not willing to die for what they know is a lie. They're not willing to sacrifice themselves for a game they're making. So there's a lot of reasons we, why we can eliminate these two options again using logic. So that's an example of Christian apologetics that points people towards a very key claim of Jesus that he is who he says he was. Now, you can continue reading on those articles about two other escape hatches that people try to make to say, oh, well, this is just a myth. Jesus never said any of these things. Or he said he claimed to be God, but in the same way that Shirley MacLaine says, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. That's the new age belief of everything is God. Okay, So you can read those on your own because I don't have time to go into those. Yeah, that's the myth option, where you don't even accept the Bible as even having anything to do with history. You have to actually go and look at the evidence that the Bible has historical accuracy. You, and that's another section of apologetics, okay? But most people just on the street are willing to say, okay, well, yeah, there was a Jesus. He, he really lived, you know, he died on the cross, you know. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for that in, in history. So, so this has weight for people who accept that much. To be honest, 
you need to do reading to, 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 to get up to speed in these areas. Maybe the reading that you would do would depend on what kind of questions are people asking you that you're having trouble answering. Well, now you kind of know the categories of apologetics, see where that fits into it. Is it philosophical apologetics, like does God exist, you know? Or is it something dealing with just basic Christian belief? Or does it deal with Catholic issues with other Protestants? So in, the, in that case, you can look and see, you know, which of these books would help you. This is the uh, beginning apologetics one, which covers the most common questions people get asked, things about Mary. Uh, this, comes with, this is a study guide for another book that goes with it. Then they have a series, it just keeps going, 2, 2.5. Here's the one on Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, you should believe in the Trinity, how to answer the Jehovah's Witnesses. So it goes over their history, a bit about that uh, religion, and then some of the problems with their teaching, uh, logical contradictions or other, other issues uh, to look at. This one's about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And then there's one on, on Our Lady as well. So these types of resources, uh, some of them had the three-hole ring binds. You can just stick them into, the, into your binder there in the section 10 to fill out your. Um. So that's all I'm going to have time to say. You can read. I have, there's more in the apologetic section. You can continue to read. Messianic prophecies that point to Jesus being God. You can look at the resurrection of Christ from the dead and do a similar tree of possibilities of how could that have happened, you know, in a natural way and then eliminate those and then see how Jesus you know, must have been God because he, he came back from the dead. Um, and all of these things are Catholic apologetics um, uh, for you to read uh, after, after the school is over.